I've missed you. Um, it's good to be back. We had some great speakers this summer, though. Amen? I uh, really thought the uh, speakers were really good. But it's good to be back. I'm going to preach a one-off uh, sermon today about the importance of investing in our children. Next week, we'll start a three-part series on Daniel, which providentially the Lord led us to set up the next series after Labor Day, which will be entitled, Did God Really Say? And I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, is going to be, I believe, the greatest discipleship issue facing the church Today and so, but today I want to talk about the importance of investing in the next generation. And I think you would agree if you have children or you're a grandparent or a family member or a sibling, this is a big deal today, right? Especially with school starting back. How many people, if you're a student in here today, high school, middle, college, elementary, how many people would say, I'm one of those people that can't wait to go back to school? Anybody raise your hand would do that? Believe it or not, that was me. I don't know why. I mean, you're probably saying, but you, you didn't like learning. No, I didn't like the school part. I liked the getting in trouble and hang out part. Anybody, that's why I like to go back to school. But uh, how many of you are saying as a student, I wish I had a little more time. Anybody want more summer? Okay. Uh, what were you growing up? Anybody, adults, who wanted to go back to school? Anybody ever excited to go back to school? Okay. Anybody always wanted more time? Okay. Well, as you think about school, I was thinking this week, it reminds us as parents and as grandparents or family members of the need to invest in the next generation. We have a revival of sorts going on right now at Long Hollow in our kids and student ministry. I don't know if you know much about it, but I've been hearing stories week after week this summer of students who have said yes to Jesus and who have said, I'm going all in for God. Uh, we've heard of even as crazy as this is, and if you're from this area, you know, school rivalries of, of school students who are going to different schools, putting aside the rivalries and forming prayer groups on the campuses they go to with other students, which you know is a big deal, right? In addition to that, they're inviting parents who don't go to our church to come encounter God really in the same way that they've encountered God this summer. And then we're seeing students who are actually uh, going to camp and inviting their parents and uh, their, their family members, many of you who have given up weeks of your time to go and invest in our students at camp. And so God's doing an amazing thing right now. And let me just remind you before we go on, we don't have allegiance here. This is secondary. Our allegiance, remember, is not to a sports team. It's not to a high school. It's not to a middle school. It's not to a college team. It's not to a mascot. Our allegiance as Christians of Jesus is to a Messiah who died on a cross named Jesus. Amen. That's where our allegiance to is. And, and I want to remind you, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, even Tennessee fans can get along with Florida Gator fans, right? Okay, that's a stretch, but you get the point. I mean, let's be honest, you can get along with rival team. But here's what I wanna talk about today. I wanna show you the importance of investing in the next generation, and it begins with the parents and the grandparents and the family members and the single adults and the young married couples in here as a trickle down effect to our students. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to the Old Testament book of Judges. The Old Testament book of Judges, we'll start in chapter two, verse six. And uh, we like to say word at Long Hollow because we wanna get into the word and we know the word changes our life. And so if you're there, Judges chapter two, uh, verse six, you can say word. If you're online watching at home, you can say word as well. Verse six, the word of the Lord. Previously, when Joshua had sent the people away, the Israelites had gone to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. So what he's talking about here is when God rescued the nation from the bondage of Egypt and brought them through the desert for 40 years and then into the promised land, this is what's going to happen. The people worshiped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime and during the lifetime of the elders who outlived Joshua. They had seen all the Lord's great works he had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance and in Timnah, Herez, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. Now watch this line. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. 
What I wanna give us today are two warnings so that we don't raise up a generation after us who does not know the Lord or the works that he has done. The first one is this, write this down. Do not suffer as a believer from spiritual amnesia. Do not suffer from spiritual amnesia. The text said that in one generation, which is about, audience participation, which is about how long? How long is one generation? About 40 years, 35 to 40 years. They did not know the Lord. Now, that phrase, did not know the Lord, is found in a couple of Old Testament passages. I'll give you one instant here. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, verse 12. And this is about Eli and his sons. It says, Eli's sons were wicked men. They did not respect the Lord. Now that's the same Hebrew word, know the Lord, respect the Lord. And it shows us that it's more than just intellectual knowledge. To not know the Lord in the case of Eli's sons, it's more than just knowledge of history. It's a defiant and rebellious attitude toward God. You gotta understand, in Eli's home, these boys were raised to know about God but they didn't really know him. And it shows us a principle I want you to get. There's a big difference, and I think you would agree, between knowing about someone and knowing someone personally, right? Or intimately. Like most of Sumner County, for the weekend of July 4th, we purchased tickets to Dude Perfect. Anybody else with me? Amen, right? I mean, we we purchased tickets because our boys love Dude Perfect. Some of you are saying, well, who in the world is Dude Perfect? Well, it's a YouTube group of about five guys who put together these crazy videos. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? First service was clueless. Okay, good. I mean, good company. Okay, first service. Anyway, so some of you know. Okay, so Dude Perfect, they do these crazy videos. And on the fourth weekend, we purchased tickets for the boys. And we purchased actually the, the meet and greet pass as a Christmas present because they love these guys and they were all excited. Now, of course, as it would happen, I got COVID the week leading up to that. And so I couldn't go to Dude Perfect, which I really wanted to go. So Candy's mom stepped in and took my place and they took the boys to this meet and greet time and they were stoked, if you can imagine. I mean, they'd seen everything every YouTube video, they've watched every stereotype video, they've seen every product review video, they knew their pastimes, they knew their hobbies, they knew their wives' names, they knew their sports teams, they they knew everything about these guys. And so here they are, they get to meet the crew of Dude Perfect and they're all jacked up, you can imagine. And imagine if Ryder goes to Cody and he says to Cody, he says, Cody, how's your wife Allison and your three boys doing? Cody's gonna look and say, who's this kid? You know, well, how's, how do you know this boy? Or imagine if Rig goes to Corey, one of the twins, and he says, hey, listen, I know your favorite athlete is the same favorite athlete of my dad. He loves Michael Jordan too, right? He would say, who is this kid? Because to know about someone is different than to know someone, right? And let's say the boys go up to Garrett, who's kind of the ringleader of the whole crew, and say, hey man, we loved that bottle rocket video you just did. And by the way, we love Tex-Mex too. We know that's your favorite food. Can we go out for lunch? Garrett's gonna say, do I know you guys? Do Do we know each other? Because to know about someone, we know a lot about a lot of people, and to know someone personally is different. So the question is, what's the difference? The difference is this. To know someone personally means you have to spend time with them. You actually have to make time with them. And it's a two-way relationship, right? It's not just talking to the person. It's actually listening to the person. It's hearing the person. It's carving out time together. So if that's the case, come in close. How well do you know Jesus because a lot of us know a lot about Jesus. But the question is, by that definition, do we actually know Jesus? And I think this is why God consistently says, remember me, remember what I've done. I mean, all through the Old Testament, and, and literally I could give you hundreds of passages with the word remember. You can do a word study yourself. I wanna give you two that show us a little bit into the mind of God. Exodus chapter 13, verse three. Right after the nation comes out of bondage, God says, hold up, Mo. (laughs) Go ahead and tell the people something for me. Just tell them this. Moses said to the people, remember this day when you came out of Egypt, out of the place of slavery, for the Lord brought you out of here by the strength of his hand. What does he want them to remember? 
The only way you're free is because of who? God. Don't forget that. Another interesting passage is Deuteronomy 6, 4, and following. And this is kind of the crux, the pinnacle of Scripture in the Old Testament. And you know this verse. Listen, Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. What does that mean? Remember them. Recall them. Don't forget them. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Let them be as a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your city gates. Now, this line here, I want to kind of zoom in on. They took that line literally. In fact, if you go to uh, the home of a Jewish man or a woman, you will normally see on the side of the doorpost slanting in something called a mezuzah. I don't know if you've heard of this before. A mezuzah is a little container, uh, normally a, a, like, a, like a cement or a metal container, that inside of it is a rolled up piece of scripture of the Torah inside, and it's nailed to the doorpost, literally, of the home. Now, You'll notice that the Jewish people will do this because they'll say it's a reminder to us that every time we walk through the house that we live in, this house is under the authority of God's word. When I went to Israel years ago, I decided to buy a mezuzah from Israel and bring it back and nail it to the doorpost of my home. So if you ever come to my house, this is on the doorpost at the right side of my home uh, right now. Now, one of the things you may say is, what's so, what's so special about that? There's nothing supernatural about the mezuzah, okay? But what it does for me and the family is that every time we walk in and see this, it's a constant reminder of God and his word that this house is under the authority of God and his word. So let me ask you, what do you do in life to remember God? Because we have a tendency as Christians to suffer from amnesia, right? We forget. What do you do to point out to your children the working of God in their life? What are you doing with your children to highlight teachable moments or to see the hand of God in difficult situations or to look for divine appointments in their life because that's what's, what we should be doing, right? I found an interesting insight. You know, I'm big on the, the difference between the Eastern culture of Jesus's day in the Bible, the Western culture of Greek Hellenistic America in which we live. It's a different way to think and, and look at the Bible. I found an interesting insight recently about how the Eastern versus Western culture views the future. It's interesting. The Western American culture in which we live, and it's not a bad thing, it's just who we are. We have a, an unhealthy, if you will, fascination with the future. We're always worried about the future. And, and don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not against setting goals. I set goals. I'm not against projecting and having vision and clarity for the future. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about we have this unhealthy preoccupation with the future, particularly for the Christians we know who are just consumed with the day and the time that Jesus is going to come back. Anybody know that guy? Might be you if you're not raising your hand. I mean, that, that's right. We know people like this. You know, there's a harbinger in Washington where the Twin Towers fell. And it means that November 22nd, 2029. I mean, this, this is a real deal, by the way. In fact, at my previous church, we used to laugh. At least every month, someone would come up with a new prediction of when Jesus is coming back, which I, I used to laugh because I used to, uh, I used to I, actually, my assistant at the time, we had our own filing system where if somebody gave me one of those pieces of paper, I'd hand it to my assistant. I'd say, file this away in the TC file, which was the trash can. But anyway, so anyway, no, but here's the thing. We used to laugh and we used to say to ourselves, it's interesting that people are so fascinated with the day and time when Jesus clearly said the son nor the angels know the day, only the father knows the return. So let me just leave you off to it. You don't have to worry about the day that Jesus is coming back. You just have to know that he's coming back one day. Amen. That's all we have to know. And so we have this fascination with the future, but we also have this fascination, this, this occupation of just thinking about, the, about heaven. We always want to go to heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven when God's trying to get to earth through us. The Jewish nation is very different. Watch this. Instead of having their face to the future like we do, they actually have their back to the future. 
They actually have perception of the present with limited clarity, but their preoccupation is with the past. Now, this is fascinating because you're saying, what are you talking about, Robbie? Follow me. When you look to the past and you see the hand of God, and you see the faithfulness of God, and you see the trust that we have in God, you are emboldened as a person to go into the future. And then every now and then, the Jewish culture will look over their shoulder at the future, but then they come back to the present. That is a radically different way to live. Now, I'm not talking about, let's not look to, I'm not talking about, let's look to the past for nostalgia or to reminisce. What I'm saying is this, when you go back into the past and you see the handiwork, don't miss this, When you see the handiwork of God, you are given courage and confidence to live tomorrow. So I wanna do an exercise with you right now and I wanna show you how this works. I want you to think of a time in your life when you went through a valley. I want you to think of it, really. I want you to think of a time, if you're a young person, when you struggle. I want you to think of a time when you had a, a difficult trial. And some of you may say, I'm in it right now, and that's okay. That, that would be even better because it's more real and relevant today. But I want you to think of a time. Everybody got one? Does everybody have one? Raise your hand. I got, a, I got many of them. But <laughs> okay. Now, I want you to go back to that time or where you are today, and I want you to look for the hand of God. I want you to look for how God worked in the midst of difficulty and struggle and setback and suffering. And I want you to notice that as you look back to see that at the time it didn't look like God was there, but then as you look back, you realize God was there the whole time. What it does is it gives you courage courage and confidence and emboldens you to live for the future. Here's an exercise I want you to do with your family this week, and it's a great exercise. I want you to go home And I want you to either write down on a chart, you can do a timeline, or you can verbally say it with your kids, but a chart's a whole lot better. And I want you to do, watch this, an autobiographical look at the highs and the lows of your life. You do it with your children. You do it with your family member. The highs and lows. So for me, it would be uh, graduating from college, real high. Getting in a car wreck, low. Uh, Getting addicted to drugs, real low. Going to rehab for the first time, that's a high. Finally get, nine months later, relapsing, low, back on drugs, you know. Go back and get saved, that's a high again, you see. Losing everything, Katrina, low, so you, that's my life. You could do that with your life, and what you will find is something fascinating. What you're gonna find as you put your life on a timeline is that at the highest points in life, yes, God was there, but you don't remember him as much as when he was present during those difficult seasons. Because here's the adage, God works the best. Let me encourage you today, if you're struggling. God works the best in the worst situations. And what you'll be surprised to find is that God has been walking with you every step of the way. Do not suffer from spiritual amnesia as a believer. Number two, here's a second neglect, or a second uh, warning. Don't neglect discipling your family. It's a big one. Don't neglect discipling your family. Let's revisit verse 10 again. I wanna, I wanna look at this again. The whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. And after them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord, who did not serve the Lord, who disrespected the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. What a sobering line, right? Right? That in one generation, they forgot God. I don't know about you, but I think you can insert the nation of America in this, and it would be pretty applicable today. Amen? I mean, I feel like that's where we are today. And I want to just challenge you to think about this. Our job as parents, our job as grandparents, is not, this is the line of the message, by the way, so pay attention. Our job as parents and grandparents is not just to teach our children what to think about the Bible. It's to teach our children how to think biblically. This is the game changer. This is the game changer. Yes, it's cool to learn facts and insights and geography of the Bible, 
But if we don't teach them how to take biblical principles and apply them to present situations, then we're in trouble. Friends, if our children, if the next generation leaves our church and goes to college or gets a job, and the only thing they leave with from Long Hollow is a couple worship songs in their head and a couple proof text scriptures in their heart, we have failed them as parents and pastors. We failed them. Because the first time they come in contact in college with an atheist professor or an antagonistic uh, college student, their whole faith is derailed. Why? Because they don't know what they believe and why they believe it. Now, you're probably saying, well, why is this a big deal? Because we are embarking on a new generation that's coming up. Yes, Generation Z is, is, is a big concern of mine, but there's another generation coming up, you may have never heard this, called Generation Alpha. Generation Alpha are my boys and below. And so my heart goes out to them, why? Because I wanna paint the picture for some of us who are my age and, and older. We don't know the world that they're coming into today. You have to realize, they are living in a world where cell phones, computers, and unlimited access to the internet is part and parcel for their life. A recent study showed that 95% of teenagers have access or own a cell phone, and 50% of that 95 are constantly connected to the internet. What that means is if a child, a teenager has a cell phone or an iPad, they are literally walking around with a loaded weapon that has the potential to stain and defame their soul and their emotions. I mean, that's the world we live in. This generation that's coming up can never remember a time where coming out of the closet was not celebrated. This generation is feeling the constant pressure of choosing a gender that is different than the biological way that God made them. That's the world they live in. And here's the challenge for us. Many of the challenges they will face today and the challenges they'll face tomorrow, many of them, watch this, are not in the Bible. They're not in here. So if we just teach them what the word says and what to think, they will not know how to apply the word in a principalizing manner to their life, which is why I always say here at Long Hollow, which y'all thought, that's ah, a cool little phrase, kind of cool, I like to say it. Get into the word, into the what? One day you're gonna say, wow, that actually means something. That's pretty cool, wow. Like that's what we want to do. We wanna get into the word until we can think biblically. Friends, if you want the mind of Christ, you have to get into the word of God, okay? Let me show you what I'm talking about. The principles in the Bible will address any problem they face in life, any problem. For example, the Bible doesn't specifically speak about pornography on a cell phone. You, I mean, you can't find that in here. Thou shalt not look at a cell phone with pornography. Thou shalt not go on the internet and look at porn. The Bible doesn't speak about that. But the Bible specifically speaks about making a covenant with your eyes against sexual immorality. Pretty clear. The Bible doesn't speak about abortion of a baby in the womb of a mother. But the Bible clearly talks about that life begins at the moment of conception. Pretty simple, right? The Bible doesn't speak specifically about racism. But the Bible speaks about treating another human being made in God's image with dignity and respect the way you would want to be treated. Amen? Pretty simple. The Bible doesn't speak about LGBTQ plus choices that many people are facing today. But the Bible speaks clearly about what it means to be made in the image of God. And that marriage has always been the same for 2,000 years of church history and 2,500 years of the Jewish history before that the marriage is one man, one woman, one flesh, one lifetime. It's only in the last 50 years that we've decided to rethink all of this. Now listen, this is exactly what the series that will start after Labor Day will be about. The title is called, Did God Really Say? And what we're gonna do in that series is we're gonna compare and contrast the, the age old question of Satan in the garden, which was, did God really say? Because when Satan whispers in your ear, he wants you to question, did God really say? When Jesus spoke, he said, it is written. Satan says, is it written? See the difference? Is it written? 
And you gotta realize what we're trying to discern and teach our children is how to navigate between the opinions of man and society and the principles of the word of God. And so what I wanna do in that series is I wanna teach you how to have a biblical worldview and apply it to whatever situation that comes about, many of whom and things we don't even know are coming. Now, let me just say this, and I have a lot of empathy for this series. I've been studying for this series for three months, night and day. I've read almost every book, almost every book I could find. I've listened to hundreds probably of hours of podcasts and debates. And, and here's what I've learned in the process of preparing for this series. I have more empathy right now than I've ever had for people struggling in this world. Number two, I'm more convinced about what I believe than I've ever been before. And so I know, listen to me, this is a complex issue. And I know even in this room, there are different beliefs about what we believe and what the Bible says. I wanna teach you how to think, and then I'm gonna challenge you to think for yourself. And we may not agree, but I'm gonna present it in such a way where you're gonna take the word of God and you're gonna discern it for your life. So here's what I wanna do in the meantime. That'll be after Labor Day. I wanna give you four practical ways as parents, as grandparents, that you can start right now and discipling and investing in your children. Four very practical ways we do this in the Gallaty home. Number one is this, start thinking about how you teach your children not what to think about the Bible, I already said this, but I'll say it again, but how to think biblically. How do I teach my children to think biblically? And at the end of the service, I'll give you a way, a resource to help you, but I'll share that in a minute. Why? Because. 10 years from now, there's gonna be another challenge. 20 years from now, there's gonna be another issue. 30 years from now, there's gonna be another technological advance that the Bible doesn't specifically speak about. But if you can think biblically, it doesn't matter what the issue is, right? Number two, encourage your children to memorize God's word consistently. I told you this before, the number, what, what took my brain from being mush from drugs, from drugs and alcohol, was the fact that I decided to memorize long passages of scripture. I, I'm convinced that rewired my brain again. I couldn't read a page of a book without forgetting. I couldn't memorize my phone number. Like, anybody been there before? Drugs and alcohol, I mean, just fried the brain. But by memorizing the word of God, it brought my mind back. But more than that, when you teach your children to memorize the word, they're able to recite it on demand when they're tempted and discouraged by the enemy. Because the reality is many of them don't walk around with the Bible at all times to quote scripture. Hold on, Satan, hold on. We don't do that. But if you have it on your heart, right, you can do it. Number three, it's important as parents to engage in missions with your children. Yes, it's important for you, dad or mom, to go to the mission field or go locally and do missions, but it's far more impactful when you take your children with you. Because what you're doing is you're showing them that they are a part of a community they live in and that they're not just a part of Long Hollow, the church. God has called you not to this church. God's called us to change this city. And if the city isn't changed, what's the point of our church, amen? We're called to change the city. Number three, finally, this is the big one. Develop an outlet for communication daily. This is a big one. Develop an outlet for communication daily. What do I mean? You should have a, an area or a platform where you can talk to your kids and they talk back without any phones or iPads or TV on. I'm a big proponent, Candy will tell you, of eating dinner as a family. We, we eat dinner as a family. The boy, do the boys wanna eat dinner as a family? No. They wanna play on iPads, they wanna look at, you know, they wanna do roadblocks, they wanna play games, they wanna go on the place. No, but we eat as a family, why? Because I'm developing, developing a platform whereby we have open communication. Now, we also do this at night before bed, you can do that. Some of you may do it in the car on the ride to school, but I'm gonna give you three questions that have been used and tested in our home, which are easy questions to ask and your students will answer, I promise. Here's the first one. Number one, I want you to give us Mom and I wanna hear, what's a high and a low from today? What was a high and a low from today? Naturally, their first response is what? I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know is not an answer, son. That's not gonna work. <laughs> try again, <laughs> right? Try again. You know, I don't really, well, try again. We're not gonna fit, we're not gonna play, this is a great line, by the way. We're not gonna play games until we're done. Okay, well, actually, you know, believe it or not, I had, had a great day, I was doing my, <laughs> that one works every time, by the way. What's a high and low from the day? Number two, here's another one. 
Where, this is a great one. Where did you see God working today in your life? See, what you're trying to do is get your children to look for divine appointments in their life where God shows up. Here's a final one, and this is really good missionally. Who is a lost friend or some friend far from God that we can pray for as a family? What that does is at an early age is give them a picture of the gospel and the need to share it with other people. One of the principles I live by, and I wanna give this to you, I want you to write this down. This is a principle that works in relationships and in parenting. Here's the principle. No contact, no impact. Write that down. No contact, no impact. What do you mean? If you don't have any contact with a person, particularly your children, you cannot expect to have any impact on their life. If you wanna raise children that grow up and never call home and never visit and never come back for holidays, keep traveling at a frenetic pace like you're doing. Keep missing the ball games, keep going away and not investing in your kids. Because the reality is this, somebody is discipling your kids and your grandkids right now. Somebody's discipling them. Is it dad or YouTube? Is it mom or the teenager in the chair at school? And so I just wanna challenge you to think about that. You cannot outsource parenting to someone else. Do you know that? You cannot outsource discipling your kids to someone else. And so I know how challenging it is personally to invest in children in this day and age. So this is what I wanna do. Our invitation today is we're gonna spend just a moment in prayer for one another. And so here's what I wanna ask you to do. If you're a student in here, uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, or college, I want you to just stand right now. We're gonna pray and, and, and don't, don't be nervous because eventually everybody's gonna stand. So believe me, don't be nervous. So stand, elementary, high school, middle school, college. And if you're the parent of that child, you stand with them because the parents, believe me, we need, we need prayer too, amen? So I want you to stand. If you're the parent of the child, I want you both to stand and we're gonna pray over both of you in a moment. Now, I know this whole message has been about parents investing in students, but you and I both know some of the great, greatest disciple makers in the lives of our kids are the teachers at school. It's the coaches they listen to. It's the administrators they look up to. So I'm gonna ask you as we begin the school year, if you're a coach or a teacher or a principal or an administrator, would you stand? Because we want to pray over you as well. And you have an amazing impact in the life of students uh, in our community. So you just stand. If you're at home, you can just raise a hand and say, hey, that's me. And uh, we're going to pray over you. So I want you to notice who's standing. And I want everyone who's not standing to stand right now. I told you we're all going to stand. So let's stand. And I want you to get around everybody that's standing, the first stand, <laughs> we need a hand on. So we need a hand on the stand, okay? So if you're standing, you need a hand on the people standing so that everyone is prayed over specifically. So you're gonna have to move, some of you, that's okay. Just move, we're gonna gather around those parents, students, administrators, teachers, and we're just gonna put a hand on them and we're gonna pray over each of them. And I'm gonna give you a moment just to pray quietly. Uh, you can pray out loud if you feel comfortable. Just pray uh, quiet, I mean, softly. And then after about a moment or two, I'm gonna close us in a corporate prayer. So let's just pray. Pray for the, for the students as they go to school. Pray for the anxiety uh, they may be facing. Pray for the principal or the coach or the teacher. Pray for the parent to be intentional, to invest and not to neglect the greatest church in their home. So uh, pray right now just for a moment and then I'll close us. Thank you, Jesus, for the privilege of praying for each other in the body of Christ. We count it a privilege to do that. God, I can't imagine the challenges that these students are facing today and future challenges that await them. And while we don't have scripture and verse for every single situation that may arise, we do have a book that's 
going to guide us principally in every situation we face. And so God, help us to be men and women of the word. Help these students to have a passion and a fire for learning the word, to get into the word, into the word gets into them. I pray for the parents right now, God, the challenges they face and the, uh, the being stretched from one place to another, the, the band and the sports and the, the travel teams and the, uh, the, the beta club and everything else that goes along with that. God, I just pray that you give them wisdom on how to respond. Let them know what is the right thing to invest in, not just good things, but great things. And help them to be present, God. Some men in here, women, may have to make course corrections to be more present at home and not be absent. I pray for the school administrators, God. We pray for the teachers. Pray for the coaches, the principals. As they go into the school year, we really believe revival can come to this community. We believe, God, you can revive students. And I know teachers live in a world where there's so much bureaucracy and laws and things that would hinder them sharing the gospel verbally, but that does not hinder them sharing the gospel with their life and the way they live and the way they treat people. To live a life that asks questions, that students would say, why is he, why is she different than other teachers I have? Why they care differently? Why they show compassion differently? And God, we'd be able to share it's because of Jesus. So God, we pray a, a, a hedge of protection around every person standing now, and we ask it in the only name we know how, and that's the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ.